on the program. The Liberian government investigates the disappearance of local banknotes worth six, about $60 billion. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta proposes tax hike on money transfer services. And Ugandan MP Bobby Wine returns home after flying to the United States for medical treatment. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Teniola Shiboeli. We begin in Liberia, where the government has banned 15 people, including the son of former President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, from leaving the country while it investigates the disappearance of two huge consignment of money printed abroad. The money, said to be local banknotes worth about $60 million, was brought into the country between November last year and August this year. Local media reports that the containers left the port in the capital in March and were thought to be headed for the central bank. Kenya's president has proposed hiking taxes on mobile money transfer services amid a tussle in government over how to boost revenues in the country. President Uhuru Kenyatta plans to increase the duty on mobile money transfer fees from 10% to 12%. This comes as the president seeks to implement planned tax hikes and other measures in this year's budget that were designed to fund a range of government development goals. Kenya's biggest mobile phone operator, Safaricom, opposes the tax rise, arguing that it would hurt the poor. Parliament is set to debate and vote on the measure on Thursday. Let's get more on this story now from an economist and the CEO of Cowrie Assets Management Limited, Mr. Johnson Chuku. Thanks for joining us on the program. My pleasure. First, there was an increase on fuel tax, which was later reduced by 8%. And now this. Why is the Kenyan government so determined to implement tax hikes on various sectors of the economy? Well, I think what is happening today, the Kenyan government is running a very huge deficit. The, the economy is about 5.9% uh, of the GDP of the country. So, and if you look at the fiscal economy act, most, um, I mean, uh, the base standard requires that your GDP, your deficit to GDP should not be more than 3%. Most countries push towards 2%, but not more than 3%. With almost 6% uh, de budget deficit, they have a major challenge in raising um, funding for their development. And that's one that's the position of the, the president, that they need, if they need to drive long-term economic development, they need to raise the next short-term pains. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most Kenyans and even the national parliament are not in support of that. They are still dealing with the battles of uh, reducing the, uh, the system percent he puts on duties on petroleum products, which has now reduced to 8%. Uh, and now he's increasing tariff on money transfer from 10% to 12%. So it's going to be a big, a big battle for him to get the parliament to approve that. But so as they seek to ways to boost its revenues, what measures can they put in place to cushion the effect of these hikes on the poor? Well, the position of um, International Monetary Fund and other um, donor and support agencies have always been that they should drive to reduce the cost of governance. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, there's also a push that they should reduce the level of corruption and begin to achieve, get value for money. Because the challenge you have in a high corrupt environment is that you don't get value for money. And therefore, the expenditure of the government in chaos does not necessarily translate to improvement in welfare of the citizens or improvement in infrastructure. So those two elements, one, reducing the government of the cost of running the government, and also reducing the level of corruption, we go a long way to freeing up resources for investment in infrastructure and development. Mm, so we know that the Kenyan National Chamber of Commerce and Industry has urged the government to cut spending and deal with corruption as a way to boost its revenue instead of hiking taxes. How easy will it be for the Kenyan government to follow through with this? Well, I think that would be a, a, bit, a bit difficult. Uh, you have to look at the structure of the Kenyan political system. Uh, if you cast your mind back to the election 
for two years ago. Uh, uh, Kenyatta barely scrapped, um, scraped to win that election. Um, the opposition party dug in until international pressure came to bear on, um, on the opposition leader to seed uh, victory. Uh, initially, he had declared himself president-elect as well. So um, the president's um, authority is very tenuous, uh, that he may not have the way with that to lean on corruption or as well as drive down um, the government bureaucracy, because the government bureaucracy is what is oiling his continuous stay in power. Uh, I, I think that would be a Herculean tax for him to achieve. CEO of Carry Assets Management Limited, Mr. Johnson Chuku, thanks for joining us on the program. Matthew. Equatorial Guinea has demanded that Brazil hand back more than $16 million worth of cash and luxury watches taken from a delegation with the president's son, Theodrin Nguma Obiang. The foreign minister describes the seizure as an unfriendly act. Mr. Obiang, who is vice president of Equatorial Guinea, no, is known for his flamboyant spending. He arrived in Brazil on Friday. Brazil prohibits people from entering the country with more than $2,400 in cash. Ugandan pop star and MP Bobby Wine is returning home more than two weeks after going to the United States for medical treatment. Mr. Wine, whose real name is Robert Kyagulani, was allegedly tortured by the military. He is out on bail after being charged with treason over the alleged stoning of President Yoweri Museveni's convoy during a by-election campaign. Meanwhile, police authorities have warned that any welcoming rally for the MP will be unlawful. The police added that only his immediate family would be allowed to receive him at the airport. South Africa's constitutional court has legalized the private use of marijuana. The judgment stems from a groundbreaking ruling in the Western Cape High Court in 2017, in terms of which the possession, cultivation and use of marijuana at home for private use was allowed. Activists had argued that the criminalization of the use and possession of it is a violation of the rights to equality, dignity and freedom of religion. Cheers and loud applause greet the ruling by South Africa's highest court to allow the private use of marijuana. Members of the Rastafarian movement and traditional healers have held marches over the years to demand that the law be changed to allow people use marijuana, which is also called DAGA, in the country. Rastafarian Gareth Prince and former DAGA party leader Jeremy Acton brought forward the case asking the High Court to allow for its home use. The party asked the court to strike down laws banning the use, cultivation and sale of marijuana. The 600 cannabis arrests a day are now going to stop because we're going to clog the courts and it's just going to be a waste of time and effort for the whole of the judiciary. Please leave South Africa's cannabis users alone. But several government departments, including the Health and Justice Ministries, opposed the legislation, warning of its harmful effects. However, in a unanimous judgment, the Constitutional Court decriminalized home consumption, saying the use of cannabis must be for the personal consumption of the adult. The ruling also approved growing marijuana for personal consumption, though it did not specify the amount that can be privately used by an adult. A group of people outside the court waved placards reading, Free the Weed, singing songs after the ruling. For the fact that healers in South Africa for the first time after so many years, you know, we are going to have all the rights you can think of. Granted by this court, the right to be able to administer medical marijuana to our patients without any sort of infringement. That for traditional health practitioners in the country is, is enormous victory. Parliament is now expected to amend the laws that criminalize cannabis following the court's ruling.